Irena Sandler was one of the most remarkable and most unlikely heroes of World War II. Sandler, a Polish Catholic, was a social worker, a job that gave her access to the Warsaw Ghetto, access she used to smuggle 2,500 Jewish babies and children past Nazi soldiers and hide them with willing poles. To tell her story on film, the Hallmark Hall of Fame assembled an all-star international cast, including Academy Award winners Anna Paquin and Marsha Gay Harden. I'd never heard of Irena Sandler, but this script came my way, and I read just the sort of, like, the little blurb about it, and she sounded so incredible that I couldn't believe it was actually a real person. She was a hero or a heroine if you want to say that, but she really, really was. And there are so many women's, just blanket women's stories around the world that aren't told. And uh, this lady was absolutely as fierce and brave as any man. The women's stories are often less, less well told and less loudly told. To have these sorts of women be held up as role models who are just as tough as tough can be and really brave and strong and these are the sort of women that you know I think we should look up to and, and so it's just the idea of getting to be part of telling that story was like the easiest decision I've ever made. When you read it when, 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 you, when you're given the material and the, there is an offer on it you know we would like you to play this part and you read the script and you see that it's kind of like you know you, you really want to do it. it it's it's so powerful Irena Sendler displayed tremendous personal courage risking her life every day to save Jewish children but the mothers of those children faced a heartbreaking decision to give up their children entrusting them to strangers in writing those scenes uh, it was interesting because I really put myself with my own children uh, I have two daughters, Anna and Sabrina, and I put myself with those, with those children at that age, and what would I have said to them? What would I have possibly said, and how would I have behaved to give them the courage to live? One of the most moving scenes, and certainly one of the most challenging to shoot, was when the orphans were marched to the trains. When we actually shot the scene, we had so little daylight there. We had maybe six hours of exposure time, and we had that day, we had 700 extras. We had 400 children, 300 adults. So these are people who were in their 80s who had lived through the war, suddenly find themselves putting on these clothes and putting on the Star of David. And there were a number of people who were crying in the scene. But the flip side, what happened was that I spent so much time getting all these people on the train and shooting it with the, all different camera angles and so on that I only had about 45 minutes left to do the scene with all the children. And I look at all these kids, they're all laughing and chewing gum and, you know, sitting around, let's get out of here on the cell phones. Like, oh no, you know, it was one smile, one, we'll just throw it right out. So they got the kids' attention and I said, many years ago, this event that you're about to portray really happened. Out of respect for those kids who died, we must do this without smiling. And there was no smile. And we shot it all in 45 minutes and that was it. Well, John's been very passionate about it. He, he did write it, he, he's directing it, he's completely in charge of it. And it's, I have to say, it's nice for actors when you see that director is, uh, knows completely what he's doing. Well, he has complete unwavering sort of passion for what he's doing. And he's an incredibly talented director and an incredibly kind man. And it, he just, makes you want to tell that story with him. I like the idea of mistakes, for one thing. I think mistakes are really important, and the accidents that actors have under pressure, because they know the character better than me, they know the character better than anyone, and the accidents they create sometimes are miraculous. One of those lucky accidents occurred between the young Yashio and his father on the train. Harrison wanted a more emotional response from the older actor. I said, okay, this we're gonna learn a new thing. It's called mess him up mess him up as an actor. He said, what, well, you know? He said, whatever this, the, your father says to you, whatever he says, talk over top, talk over him. Say, no, Papa, no, please, no, I love you. Please, come with me, no, Papa, no, please, no. So the scene began, Scott started doing his lines, and Sergey right away, no, Papa, no, and you can see his face. He became so frustrated, 
And Sergey kept talking, no, Papa, and he's down this hole, he's about to drop out of the train, he says, no, Papa, I love you, please, and, and his dad's like, Sh -sh -sh shut up, <laughs> you've got to be brave. <laughs> As writer and director, Harrison knew he had a great story to tell, but one key moment convinced him he had a powerful movie. The key moment for me, I remember this clearly, was I got the tape of the audition for Rebecca Wyndham. When I saw her audition, I said, that's it, I have it, I got the movie. Now everybody has to meet her level. I played the part and I thought about saying goodbye to my family and knowing that they might not survive and that I would have a new life without them all alone. And that kind of... Right over. She broke down crying. <laughs> exactly. It just... That was the shortest, sort of easiest audition I ever had. There was one take where she she wasn't acting, she just, she was, a, yes. Like many in the cast and crew, Rebecca's family had a personal connection to the story. My parents were in the Piotrkova ghetto. They were in concentration camps. They saw the, some of the difficult scenes that, that, are, that are portrayed in this movie. Most of my family didn't make it. And I'm actually very honored that my daughter gets a chance to be the voice of these family members that didn't make it. It's nice to know what's happened and make sure it doesn't happen again. The cast clearly met and exceeded Harrison's expectations. Anna Paquin was part of the team that made the movie. She wasn't even the actor. She didn't step aside. She wasn't apart from everybody. She was there every day at call. She was there if it was cold. She didn't wear shoes so she could be cold. She sweated it out and she fought it out in the trenches with everybody. She was remarkable. She's a remarkable young woman. And I really admire her. And she is honest to a fault, which I love. And she's direct. And those, the combination of those qualities um, would suggest to me someone who certainly could embrace the spirit of Irina Sendler. Uh, Goran I like tremendously. Thank goodness that he is such a pro because he brought kind of magical timing to, to every, every scene that he played. And Marsha too. Well Marsha that was, it was interesting because she is very far away from dying. You know, so she has to play a mother who stays in the apartment and dies. I, I bless her for doing it. <laughs> <laughs> really, she was she was terrific. Although Poland seemed to be the logical place to shoot the movie, it wasn't to be. I knew Warsaw pretty well because I've written the script there, and I'd, everything's being built now for the uh, Euro, the Euro Games in, in 2012. So every, there's construction everywhere. The traffic is a nightmare. And then we went uh, we we went to Latvia. I looked there. I think it was quite a remarkable old town. But what was even more interesting was just just out of the firelight were these abandoned factories, the actual ghetto where 300,000 Jews I think had been massacred was still there and uh, there was so much destruction of that period's whole streets that hadn't been renovated, not even touched, that were cobblestone that hadn't been touched from the war and it has a fantastic look I think this, this movie, it, this replicates that period really well. We're in Latvia and it's December and it's cold and we're outside and it's incredibly depressing and sort of sad subject matter at times, but I love it. I love being part of something that feels important and to be sort of on these locations that look so eerily like the pictures of Warsaw from that time. We had one, I could say, marginal location that was for the end of the movie and the only farm we could find was this kind of educational farm and it was log cabins and it looked pretty suspect. Fortunately, the night before we shot the scene, it snowed eight inches, and then it got cold, so the snow stayed on the branch. Eight inches of snow on the little branches, on the rails, on the whole, you couldn't even see this pioneer farm. And the ending of the movie is this gorgeous, fantastic, romantic white forest. I was concerned about continuity, and then I just gave up. I said, I'm gonna surrender, I'm gonna surrender this whole thing because it could snow one day, rain another day, and I just got, I can't worry about it. I think we are pretty lucky on the continuity. And, but <laughs> the one place where it was kind of odd because this snowstorm kind of came up while we were putting up the lights inside. 
So the snowstorm built out, and I had f sort of forgot it was happening. And then we shot the scene, and he opened the door, and there's a blizzard out there. Welcome to Warsaw. Focus and, and feeling it intensely enough isn't really a problem on this particular job because so often what you're supposed to be reacting to is being actually physically created right in front of you. So when I'm taking my best friend's daughter out of the ghetto and it happens to be the morning that troops and tanks and burst through the streets and Nazi soldiers are running and grabbing people and beating them and throwing them into trucks and chasing you. And, you know, we're doing a film, but there's still large men with guns dressed frighteningly chasing after you in tanks. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't feel as, uh, as fictional as sometimes being on a film set feels. With a truly international cast, dealing with the language differences was a challenge. In reality, everyone in our film would have either been speaking Yiddish, German, or Polish, and obviously because we're none of us <laughs> Yiddish, Polish, or German speakers, and we're playing for an English-speaking audience, that was obviously not going to be an option. To that end, um, I've devised a kind of convention of speech for the film that everyone can do. It's easy for the actors, and it's just certain sounds that um, give that flavor. So what I've done, for example, I've asked the actors not to be able to pronounce TH. So with becomes wid, and thing becomes ting. And I've asked the uh, writer, the, our lovely director, to take out all the contractions in, in the speeches so that won't becomes will not. It's kind of like a a hint, if you like, of the accent, but without it ultimately being in any way distracting, hopefully. One interesting thing I have in this, uh, in this particular project is Goran Visnich. I said to him, one of the conventions of this is that we have to say ting and wid and duh. And he said, no, that was the worst thing I have to say on the whole project, because now suddenly, after nine years of speaking English like you guys, you know, these, those, and the other ones, now I need to say these, those, and the other. Every job I've ever done, I've worked in an accent that's not my, my own one, so that's just, I like that stuff. It's part of getting into the, into the character. Irena wasn't someone special who did it out of some special moral reason that she was like any of us, who she just, it was the right thing to do, so she did it. From my research into Arena, she didn't take no for an answer. If someone said, that's not possible, she was, she was like, okay, but if it were possible, what would I need to do? And that sort of idea that if you want to get, if you want, if you believe in something enough, that you, you'll figure out how to make it work, you know? And I think that's an incredible attitude to have towards towards life. I think it's wonderful that we can give tribute to uh, to this incredibly courageous person. Uh, it, this movie shows the dark side of human nature, but uh, there's, uh, there's also something uplifting about the, uh, the fact that uh, a person like Irina Sendler could, uh, could risk her life, which she didn't have to do, uh, to save others. I was particularly struck by by something that I read that she had said where she was glorified uh, for this, uh, for these acts, and she said, this is not a cause for glory, this is the reason for my existence. Um, I, I, th I think that's incredible. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, that Rebecca can be part of this. Having these sort of, these moments of history recreated, it, it feels like we're, we're a small part of doing something it's, it is important. It's nice to, to feel like you're helping out in a bigger sense in some way, even if it's very small. Irena Sandler was all but forgotten for more than 50 years, until four students at a small Kansas high school uncovered her story and brought it to the world's attention. You can learn more about the life of Irena Sandler and the students that were inspired to tell her story at irenasendler.org.